I'm going to watch a little video now about a woman who met Jesus Christ and how it changed her life. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins are forgiven, for she loved much. I have lived in Nain all my life, and all my life, it seems, has been full of heartache and disappointment. I know that the choices I've made have caused me much harm, and in turn, have caused much pain for those around me. I didn't start out that way. I mean, whoever starts with one sip of wine only to become an alcoholic. Whoever plans to give herself to one man only to be had by many. My life had spun out of control and I could find no path of escape. Until one day, a friend of mine asked me to go hear Jesus speak on the hillside. She said, he is one who teaches about love and the forgiveness of sins. Who would know about such things? But knowing that the flame in my heart had been out for so long, and knowing that I had nothing left to lose, I decided to go. Something lit up in me as I heard Jesus speak. His words were different. They were full of life and not empty promises. He spoke about the unconditional love that comes from God. A love that didn't have to be earned. A love that's full of mercy and grace. A love that doesn't judge or condemn, but brings forgiveness and freedom. And that's precisely why I went to the Pharisee's house that day. I knew Jesus was there, and I just couldn't let him leave without thanking him. As I stood behind Jesus, I heard the Pharisee's familiar whisper, what's a sinner like her doing in a place like this? Only this time, I didn't listen to them. I was so moved by Jesus' presence that the tears began to fall. It's as if my heart was pouring out all my wrong choices, all my bad decisions, all my shame and rejection. My soul stood bare before Jesus, and I knew I was understood. I was so overcome with love for him that I knelt down, and with my tears and my hair, I began to wipe his feet. I thought now would be the perfect time to give him my gift. And so I took out my jar of perfume and I poured the fragrant oil out onto his feet. Jesus turned to the Pharisees and said, I tell you this day, her many sins have been forgiven for she has loved much. And then Jesus turned to me and told me four words that I will never forget. Your sins are 
forgiven. Everyone in the house began asking, who is this one who even forgives sin? And then Jesus turned to me and said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I know who this one is who forgives sin. You see, I met him and he met me. It was there at his feet that I found forgiveness. I found my reason and that there's reason for me. No matter the cost, I will choose to follow Jesus and worship him with all that I have. For he has saved me. He set me free. He rebuilt me. Now I will build for him. Thank you. You know, there's an old saying that the ground is level at the cross, meaning that we're all sinners, we all stand before God, the same position. We may not have committed the sins this woman of the Bible had committed, but you know, one sin separates us from God. And we all need that forgiveness. We all need that movement in our life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, I'm amazed by it because if there was anyone who was justified in condemning us, it's you. If there's anyone who could hold all against us, it's you. But Lord, you've chosen to extend grace and mercy towards us. You've chosen to forgive us. You know that's the only way that we could have fellowship with you. And so you came, died for our sins, so that those four words child, your sins are forgiven, can apply to each and every one of us. So Lord, help us. Help us to get a renewed insight, a renewed vision of your love for us and what you've done for us. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Going to be in a different passage than in your bulletin. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6. Again, we're talking about, does Jesus know when I feel forgotten? And it's easy to feel forgotten, and it's something that really drives us. We want to be remembered. Some people build great monuments, great buildings, or have things named after them, hoping that they'll be remembered. It, it, it helps us know that we existed And so a lot of effort goes into that. It's important. And it hurts us when we think that maybe we've been forgotten. You know, I I have pastored in the churches I've pastored, had many senior saints in the churches. And one thing that I've always been cognizant of is that perhaps now you're not able to do the visitation, or do some of the labor. But I remember that before I was even born, you were doing the work in the church. You were going to see people, to tell them about Jesus Christ. You were ministering in His name all these years. 
and I, I don't lose sight of that. And so I wanted to close out our series this Sunday on that to remind you, you're not forgotten. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 1. We'll pick up the verses later on the screen. The, the author here is writing. It says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. So when we read that, we should think, well, what are the elementary teachings? What is it we should have settled? And he goes on to list them not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death or sin, of faith in God, instructions about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. As you hear that list, you may think those are anything but elementary teachings, but it kind of tells you of how much there is that God wants us to know. And too often we can stay in those very basic passages that are wonderful, but we need to move on. We need to grow. And so the writer says, and God permitting, we will do so. We will move towards maturity. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, verse 4, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance, because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace." And I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but if you ever, have ever had the thought in your mind that he can't forgive me, I've done too much bad, I'm, I'm, I'm just unforgivable. The only way you can be forgiven is for Christ to do what he's done. And so if you think that wasn't sufficient the first time around, you're saying, Jesus, you've got to go back and do it again. You've got to be rejected some more. You've got to be beaten some more. You've got to die on the cross again. But of course, that isn't the case. Jesus' work on our behalf was sufficient. And the problem is not in His action, but in our faith. And so we need to accept that and believe it. Verse 7, land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful for those for whom it is farm receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Foreshadowing of the end times. Verse 9, this is where our scripture picks up. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case. Things that accompany salvation. In other words, he's talked about the elementary things that we need to know, we need to understand, but we leave behind. And here he's saying there's more than just the salvation. You know, Jesus said, I've come to save, seeking to save that which was lost. But he also said, I have come that they might have life and that more abundant. It doesn't stop at salvation, the walk with Christ. The rewards don't stop with our salvation. We have other joys, other rewards, not just heaven, but here on earth by walking with the Lord, by trusting in Him, by serving Him, by being fertile ground as talked about previously. And then he goes on, verse 10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him. That ought to be very comforting to you that have worked so long to preach the name of Jesus Christ and however you did it. It can be in giving a cup of water to someone who is thirsty providing a meal. It's sharing, of course, the good news from the Scripture. But He will not forget the work and the love you've shown as you helped His people and continue to help them. We want each of you 
to show this same diligence to the very end. You see, it's easy to feel forgotten. It's easy to think it doesn't matter. It hadn't changed anything. All I've been doing is just spinning my wheels. I, I, I could have gone on and done other things that were more fun. But he's reminding us here that we need to stay diligent to the good work, the work of God, to the very end. That end being when we're called home, however that is. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. We live in such a microwave world, such an instant world, and we get discouraged too easily because things don't happen right away. And we have a, a bad habit that I call the tyranny of the many, that if we don't see throngs and throngs and throngs of people coming to worship God or coming to salvation, that we're a failure. But if we'll pause and think about Jesus' work, Jesus was a concerned with the one. He gives us the parable of the lost sheep. If we were the shepherd, we had a hundred sheep and one of them went missing, we'd find, say, well, it's a cost of doing business. Not worth going to find it, but to Jesus it was. To Jesus, that one was worth the shepherd going to find. And when the shepherd found that sheep, it put it on its shoulders and carried it back to rejoin the flock. We have the other parable of the widow and her mite. Didn't have much and she lost one coin and it says she scrubbed down. She cleaned her house until she found that one mite. And this is teaching us the importance of the one. And so we can, we can get discouraged if we want to look at the big results at throngs coming, at uh, just a great turnout to something we're trying to do. But that one coming to the Lord, there is rejoicing in heaven over each one. One by one they came as far as the eye could see. And so in, in, in dealing with feeling forgotten, we need to deal with it in some ways by broadening our understanding and by accepting that just because we haven't seen the results we want, we've failed. I admire missionaries who go to foreign lands to share the faith and missionaries here in the States in foreign lands like New York City and Chicago and those places. I've heard stories of foreign missionaries especially who have been on the field for years and years and never seen anyone come to accept Christ. And I wonder if I had that kind of dedication to get up each and every day to go out and proclaim Jesus Christ? Or, or would I give up because they're just not hearing me? Maybe I need to go to a different field. Maybe I need to go to a different area. But people in each area, everywhere, need to hear. And we need to keep the work up. We need to be that diligence that he says. And so we need to understand that just because we haven't seen the results we think we should get, or the results sometimes that are played up in church circles that we've failed. Jesus doesn't call us to save a single soul. He calls us to tell them about salvation. I don't have the power to save anybody. Neither do you. But I have the ability and the power to tell them about Jesus Christ, to show them Jesus Christ. And that is important. That is something we may never see the fruit come until perhaps 
that day in glory. And perhaps God will allow us to have these people come up and say, Sir, you didn't know me, but what you said mattered, and I accepted Christ. And so, while here on earth, and that's why I love that song so much that I did there, it says, maybe the things you've done here on earth are unnoticed and forgotten, but they're not in heaven. Your heavenly Father remembers your effort. He remembers your work, your toil, remembers your heart, what you're trying to do. And there is coming that reward one day as we stay firm, as we follow Him, as we are diligent. And in our midst, we are seeing God working. We're seeing lives being transformed and you may not see it if you're looking for the big, big changes. But if you look closely, you'll see the lives changed. So what you've been doing isn't forgotten by God. The one that matters. You know, some time back I was thinking people are hesitant to proclaim their faith or they're hesitant to do something out in the open. They're afraid of being rejected. I understand that. They're afraid of being ridiculed, of mocked. And I understand that. That's part of our human nature. But something came to me is when we go to be with God, when we take our last breath, when we're in heaven, who is it we're going to stand before? It's not going to be any of you. It's not going to be any of those who laughed at you or ridiculed you. It's going to be our Lord and Savior. He's going to be the one that's standing at the right hand of the throne of God. He's the one that you want to hear Him say, Father, this is one of my children. I know Him. And He needs to enter in. And so we do what we do in spite of the rejection around us for the one and for the one that when we get to heaven, we hear that, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now enter into thy rest. And someone's once said that how can we expect to hear the well done if we haven't done well? I like those turns of phrases. We hear the well done when we get up there when we have done well for Christ here on earth. He remembers. I, I love this scripture there in Hebrews chapter 6. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown Him as you, as, as you have helped His people and continue to help them. And so part of the question is, does Jesus care? Does Jesus know when I feel forgotten? We have a scripture that tells us so, but I can assure you he does because Jesus knows what it feels like to be forgotten. He knows what it feels like to work in someone's life and then they go on and do contrary to what he says. He knows what it feels like when, when he blesses with salvation or and some help, and then the people think they did it all themselves, or they go on and live a life that doesn't honor God, forgetting God effectively. And I thought, you know, how much we forget God. And I wonder, I know there are different ways to do it, but I had thought about asking, I don't think I'll do that, but how many have their Scripture with them? How many carry their Bibles to church? The one place we're studying, do you have yours that you can open? Sometimes it's on phones, I get that. That's how the preacher doesn't know if you're playing a game, watching sports, or reading your Scripture. And that's good and valid. It's convenient. But there's something about opening the Word of God 
reading, making notes in it. My Bible's all scribbled up with things that God impressed upon me. But God knows that forgetfulness on our part. All through the Old Testament, that's what it's about. Time and again, God saved the Israelites. The book of Judges is seven cycles where they fell under dominion. They cried out to God. God saved them. And then they forgot them again. Over and over. So yes, God understands being forgotten. And we can honor Him by being sure we don't forget. He hadn't forgotten us. You're not going to have to worry when you get up to heaven that your reservation's not there. It's written in the book of life. He knows your name and he, He's waiting on you. Not going to rush it, but He's waiting on you. He's eager to see you coming up the road. So today, I do hope two things. One, I hope that you'll re realize and take stock in the fact that your service to God is remembered. You have friends here who remember those, but more so it's remembered by the God of heaven. He knows everything. But also that we would not forget. That we would remember what He's done on our behalf that we would know it deeply. You see, we, the hardest part is the 18 inches between the head and the heart. We know cognitively what Jesus did for us. We're intelligent people. We can read the Word and read how He did these things. But it being up here in our head doesn't change our life. It's when it becomes part of our life, our heart, and it changes what we do. It changes how we perceive life, how we perceive each other, that we start seeing people with the compassion of Jesus Christ, that we start becoming burdened that they don't know Him, that we see through God's eyes. That's the challenge. And it can become clouded by the cares we have in the day, by the struggles we face, so may God help us to see, to be reminded of His great love for us, but to be reminded to continue to worship Him deeply and faithfully. We're going to go into our hymn of response, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, I Fain Would Take My Stand. A great, great hymn. It may be that Hopefully, God speak into your heart and you realize that you need to acknowledge that you remember what He's done in your life. It may be that it's time to unite with this local fellowship so that you can officially become part of this family. Yeah. You're part of us. You bless and encourage us by doing that. It may be that you just need to stand and say, Lord, forgive me for my forgetfulness. And thank you for remembering me. Let's stand and sing two stanzas of Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
that stand beneath the cross. We're going to say our closing scripture as we have been. Missed it last week. We had a lot going on, a lot of great things going on, but I want to get back to it, reminding us, helping us not forget of the challenge before us. Read along with me. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Going to have our word of benediction. I'm asking the deacons to come see me just for a minute up front here after the service. Let's have our closing prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for all that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for this message today, for the reminder to be diligent in the work that we do for you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be patient and to understand that things don't always work out as fast as we would like for them to, and they, they certainly don't always go the way you want. But we know that you are in control, and we know, Father, that you are working. We just pray that you would continue to give us patience and strength, that you would help us to seek your will and help us to always look in the direction that you would have us to go. I pray for each family that's represented here today, Lord. Pray that you would continue to bless them and strengthen them. I pray for those that are not here for whatever reason. Father, help us to spread your good news. Forgive us when we fail you. Be with us as we leave this place. All these things we ask and pray in your son's most holy name. Amen. Mm -hmm.